Today on Twin Cam, we've gone back to the early 1980s and this Vauxhall Opal full range brochure from June 1983. This is an era where a whole scale mechanical upheaval in Britain's most popular cars was well underway. And through this brochure, we can see that change unfolding as this is a bit of a changeover year for Vauxhall. For the sizable proportion of my viewers that aren't from the UK or mainland Europe, Vauxhall is a traditionally British car company that was bought by General Motors over 90 years ago in 1929. From the 60s onwards, GM began to rationalise its European operations, merging vehicle development between Vauxhall and the much larger Opel based in West Germany. Over time, this meant that Vauxhalls and Opals became the same cars, with Vauxhall eventually being withdrawn completely in mainland Europe and the opposite in the UK. But here in the early 1980s, Vauxhall and Opal dealer networks had recently merged, leaving us with a predominantly Vauxhall badged lineup and the Opal brand reserved for sleeker, more sporting cars, as we'll get to in a few minutes. In this period, the emphasis was on Vauxhall, Opel and General Motors all operating as one big happy family, combining knowledge to produce a range that would challenge to be number one. After all, in the UK, Vauxhall was on the up, overtaking British Leyland and attempting to challenge Ford as the top selling manufacturer. There are over 60 models in the Vauxhall Opal lineup spanning no less than eight distinct car ranges. And they're the sort of cars more and more people want to own. Small cars, large cars, family cars, sporty cars, saloons, hatchbacks, estates, coupes, petrol engines, fuel injected engines, diesel engines. It's a tremendous choice and one of the reasons why Vauxhall Opal range is widely acknowledged to be one of the most dynamic in the industry. There's also the style, the advanced engineering, the high specifications and a totally new slant on value combining to win over more and more motorists to Vauxhall Opel. Operating as an integral part of General Motors, the world's largest motor manufacturer, Vauxhall Opel cars are designed and built in Europe with the backing of vast technical resources. At the world-famous Technical Centre in Detroit, GM scientists and engineers are taking car technology to new boundaries and in the process ensuring that today's models are ahead of the field. A lot of this immense know-how is reflected in the cars in your local Vauxhall Opel dealership and in the many new and exciting models constantly expanding this big range. For more details, ask your friendly Vauxhall Opel dealer for a copy of the comprehensive all-model catalogue. This page highlights the newest member of the range, and that's where we're starting, with Vauxhall's new super mini, the Nova. In June 83, this was a brand new model, having only come to Britain two months before in April. But unlike any normal model launch, this was a big one for Vauxhall. The Nova's predecessor was the Vauxhall Chevette, but that car was slightly larger and mechanically much older. As a result, the Nova felt like a new market segment for Vauxhall, competing directly with the Ford Fiesta and top-selling Austin Metro. In mainland Europe, this car was known as the Opel Corsa, the two cars being identical, and they were built alongside each other in Spain, something that in the context of 1983 caused a bit of controversy. The old Chevette was built in Britain, as was the Fiesta and Metro, making the Nova, despite its British badge, the only one of the big three super minis not to be built in Britain. And though it never matched the sales figures of the Metro and Fiesta, that fact certainly didn't harm the Nova's success, as for the next decade it was the go-to small car for teenagers and those in their 20s. The Nova's styling, more than anything, drawing younger people to the car thanks to its sleek front end, stout, purposeful stance, and of course, the endlessly cool box arches. The Nova was seen by many as the coolest of the super minis, especially so when in SR trim with three spoke alloys, but it was a car that was consistently updated through production. Early cars like these having full-depth egg crate grills and a dashboard that feels very cobbled together. 
But the Nova was one of the first of what I'd term the second generation of Super Minis, as it was joined by the Mark II Fiesta, Peugeot 205 and Renault Super 5 within 18 months. That meant that initially the Nova looked quite advanced, with the option of an all-new overhead cam 1.3 litre engine and a 5-speed gearbox, something only Volkswagen could match with their Mark II Polo. This brochure is really weirdly set out with the model ranges in a seemingly random order. So we're now going to flip through to where we begin to see the legacy of this switchover. The Vauxhall Chevette was still being offered, albeit in a reduced range. In fact, you'd still be able to get a Chevette through to January 84, and this was the final Vauxhall to be visually different from its Opel counterpart. The Chevette was an Opel Cadet C, but built in Britain and fitted with a different nose, our last remaining example of Vauxhall's signature droop snoot that identified the brand through the 1970s. The Chevette was launched in 1975 and was rather unusual for a British car of this era, as it was available both as a traditional saloon and as a hatchback. For comparison, BL made the decision to keep cars like the Austin Allegro as a saloon, despite the shape lending itself to a hatch. And the Ford Escort was very much a traditional three-box saloon. Such was the perceived psyche of the British buying public. As a result, the Chevette was seen to be slightly smaller than these cars in hatchback form, though the saloon did directly compete with the likes of the Escort. As I mentioned earlier, the Nova was seen to succeed the Chevette despite being smaller, and the Opel Cadet continued to be developed in that small family car segment as defined by the Escort. But I believe that this is just due to the fact that British consumers weren't particularly familiar with buying hatchbacks as direct equivalents for saloon cars. That means we can compare the Chevette most directly to something like the Chrysler Sunbeam, both larger than a Fiesta and smaller than an Escort. What both the Chevette and Sunbeam had in common, barring the hatchback, was a longitudinal engine rear drive platform, something that Vauxhall really started to phase out between then and the time of this brochure. So this is something of a carryover from a bygone era, a car that was mechanically traditional and that had been replaced in all guises by the time this brochure was published. That makes it noteworthy that this car still managed to find a place in the range. In fact, the Chevette clearly had a different target audience compared to the Nova. Generally, the publicity shots feature middle-aged folk. It's a more conservative car, probably for those who were suspicious of that new-fangled front-wheel drive. Compare it to the Nova's page, and the people are a lot younger, and there's action involved there, rather than the much more relaxed vibe of the Chevette page. The more appropriate Chevette replacement, and the British-built translation of the next-generation Opel Cadet, was the Vauxhall Astra. However, this car technically replaced the Vauxhall Viva, which dated back to the mid-1960s, and that car had its own range reduced when the Chevette was launched in 75. I think we're beginning to see the slight confusion that comes with rationalising together the model ranges of Opel and Vauxhall, but this car is quite possibly the most historically important in the whole range. Interestingly, this is the only Vauxhall that would eventually lend its name to its Opel counterpart, as over the following decade the two brands would rationalise their model names as well to being the same, no matter the badge on the grille. But this car was a big departure from the Chevette and all previous Vauxhalls when it was launched in 1979. It was generally available as only a hatch or an estate, with a saloon version only lasting a few months. It also caught up with your British Leylands and Fiats, finally adopting the accepted recipe of a modern car, thanks to a transverse engine and front-wheel drive. The mechanical improvements don't end there though, as the Astra was also gifted an all-new engine. The range at this point consists of 1200, 1300, 1600 and 1800 cc petrol engines. The 1200 was the existing overhead valve unit that dated back to the Cadet A, but the 1300 was the first application of the all-new GM Family 1 engine, with the 1600 and 1800 hailing from the Family 2, also a brand new engine. 
These two shared an aluminium cylinder head and an overhead camshaft, features that still weren't at all universal, and the Family 2, at least, would see service all the way through to 2014. It can be argued, therefore, that the Mark I Astra was the car that brought Vauxhall's range into the modern era, but what it also did was add freshness. Vauxhall's compact 1970s range may have been perfectly good, but it never endeared buyers enough to seriously compete with Ford and British Leyland at the top of Britain's sale charts. The Astra, however, was desirable. It very quickly overtook the Allegro, paving the way for Vauxhall's newfound success in the 80s. And it's cars like this Astra GTE that did so much for the perception of Vauxhall, to the point where the all-new Astra carries styling touches like the vent in the pillar to emulate the original. But if the Astra was the start of Vauxhall's turn towards front-wheel drive and a prosperous 1980s, then it was the Mark II Cavalier that really cemented that success. Launched in 1981, this was the British-built translation of the third-generation Opel Ascona, itself the European implementation of General Motors' famous J-Car platform. With production at Vauxhall's now traditional home of Luton, the Cavalier, much like the Astra being built at Ellesmere Port, can still very much be seen as a British car, even if development took place elsewhere. Following on from the Astra, this was their second front-drive car, and their first in this market segment that was still dominated by the traditional rear-drive saloon-bodied Ford Cortina. While British Leyland had been flirting with the idea of hatchbacks, it took Vauxhall to actually prove to the British market that they were now mainstream. While the aerodynamically styled Ford Sierra would replace the Cortina for 82, bringing with it a hatchback, it was the Cavalier that was technically the much more modern car, while maintaining a more conservative appearance and the availability of a saloon for those who wanted it. With wariness of front-wheel drive now rapidly fading, many of those disillusioned with the Sierra's hatchback and styling flocked over to Vauxhalls like this. These Cavaliers were incredibly popular, far more so than any previous Vauxhall, helping the Mark II to trade places with the Sierra at the top of this market during the mid-80s. Considering Ford's dominance in Britain over the past 50 years, the fact that the Cavalier was Britain's second best-selling car in 84 and 85 is not something to brush past. It's even something Vauxhall feel the need to mention in the first sentence on this page. The company would really have felt this surge in sales, as Cavalier sales quadrupled between 1981 and 84. With the new transverse engine layout came an engine range now all with overhead camshafts and electronic ignition, and from 1986, the option of a catalytic converter as well. The Cavalier also brought fuel injection on the 1.8, one of the first big sellers in this class to do so. Before we look at Vauxhall and Opel's executive offerings, we'll first turn to the Opel Manta. This is one of only three Opals available in Britain during 1983, as Britain's relative unfamiliarity with the brand allowed GM to position Opals slightly apart from their Vauxhall stablemates. This second-generation Manta had been launched in 1975 and was based on the Mark I Cavalier or Ascona B. Therefore, it was rear-wheel drive, and offered a more rakish alternative to the standard upright saloon cars, as hot hatches weren't really a big thing at that point. However, 1983 is very much into the hot hatch era, and so the Manta begins to lose its appeal, but there are bigger reasons for that. The difference between hot hatches and this niche segment though, characterised by the Manta and Ford Capri, itself a coupe-bodied Cortina, was that you could have practically the whole engine range, so you could get the look of a sports coupe despite only paying for a tiny engine. And it's this point that begins to reveal that loss of appeal. At the time of this brochure, the only engine available in the Manta was the 1.8. Therefore, it's not particularly quick for its size. It certainly doesn't have the speed, style or cool touches of the Ford Capri that was available at the same time. All that the Manta of 1983 has to set it apart, really, is a deep bumper and a coupe body. 
There isn't really anything else, unlike the clear sporting intentions of the Astra GTE we've just seen. You can even describe it as merely the old Cavalier, but with less practicality. And that's a massive shame, as I like the Manta, but this just isn't impressive. Even the smallest of hot hatches could outperform this Manta. Although the Manta and Capri did garner a somewhat unsavoury image through the 80s, I love the fact that cars like this exist. They're just that little bit more grown up than a hot hatch, and though not as usable, they are more of a stylistic statement. Not necessarily these 1.8, but a nice Manta GTE, when it was available, is the kind of car that took a very normal platform and made it into something masquerading as a supercar, and that's just cool. Before GM rationalised the Vauxhall and Opel ranges, you could get a Manta badged as a Vauxhall Cavalier Coupe or Sports Hatch, but it's best known in its final Opel guise. That being said, at the Manta B's launch, all cars, no matter the badging, had the trademark Vauxhall droop snoot like the Cavalier and unlike the Ascona. For 1982, however, the Manta was facelifted and while retaining a shade of that previous Vauxhall-inspired style, it now bore no similarity to the all-new Cavalier we've just looked at, making it unique in the range. We've now covered all of GM's real mass market cars and we're heading up into the executive segment, one that Vauxhall and Opel abandoned decades ago, but in 1983 they were still a strong presence, starting off with the Vauxhall Carlton. The presence of Vauxhall and the like in this segment and above was destroyed by the growing popularity of BMW and Mercedes-Benz in particular, as their smaller models became more desirable than larger offerings from mainstream manufacturers. I choose to mention that point here because it's 1983, and 1983 was the year that tipped the scales towards the premium manufacturers, as BMW launched their E30 Generation 3 Series and Mercedes-Benz came down a rung to compete with the W201, otherwise known as the Mercedes 190. But for the majority of the British public in 1983, a nicely specced Carlton was a statement of success. This is the facelifted Mark I Carlton, a rebadged Opel Record E, and if you're from Australia or New Zealand, this is essentially a VB, VC or VH Holden Commodore, just without the cool V8s. When the Carlton was launched in 1978, it was built by Vauxhall at Luton, and featured the droop snoot we've discussed a couple of times, but when it was facelifted in 1982, it gained a more modern, plastic-laden, aerodynamic appearance of the new Cavalier, as did the record, and production shifted away from Luton to Opel in Germany. Now that the two cars were completely identical other than badges, that made sense. But you can therefore make the argument that this is one of the turning point cars for Vauxhall. At its launch, though mechanically identical to the Opel, it had its own unique appearance and was built in Britain. By this point, it had become identical to the Opel and was built in Germany. Unlike the rest of the family cars we've seen, barring the run-out Chevette, the Carlton is the first that retains a rear-drive platform. The benefits of transverse engine packaging just aren't big enough on a car of this size, and so it is completely conventionally engineered. In fact, the Carlton has McPherson struts at the front and a live axle at the back. Though the Rover SD1 also used this basic setup, it was one of the few areas in which the Carlton was criticised. It just didn't have that edge of refinement and performance that, by this stage, most of its competitors had. For 1983, the Carlton was available with a 2.3-litre non-turbo diesel, an indication of what would come over the following decades, but the range was still dominated by petrols, either 1.8 or 2 litres. What it lost was a six-cylinder engine. Though badged as either an Opel Commodore or Vauxhall Viceroy, a big 3-litre engine was available before this facelift, but to get that power unit in 83, you had to take the step up to an Opel Senator. The only Opel saloon car on offer, the Senator sits right at the top of the range, presumably as an Opel to make the British public differentiate it from a Nova, for example. But I'm not sure. 
It's certainly a weird move to make this the only Opel family car on offer, rather than retain its old Vauxhall badged counterpart, the Royale. But whatever the reasoning, they did it. Not that it lasted very long. The Royale was discontinued in favour of the Senator in 82, but in 85, the Opel branding was dropped, and the car became the Vauxhall Senator. This car, therefore, was both the last Opel family car ever sold in Britain, and I'd expect, in this form, ridiculously rare. I know the How Many Left website isn't particularly accurate, but I thought it worth getting a ballpark figure, and it's five. Five Opel Senators are apparently still registered on UK roads. So, what was the Senator? Well, actually, it's just a lengthened Carlton. I'm sure you can see the similarities, not just in the brand identity, but in the doors, for example, as well. We can think of this as less of a different car and more of an absolutely top-spec Carlton, with a bit more presence, boot space, and of course, those six-cylinder engines, either at two and a half or three litres, and both with fuel injection. If a nicely specced Carlton was a bit of a statement, then a Senator was the sign that you'd made it. It wasn't really designed as a family car, but a vehicle that would appeal to that kind of buyer, a conservative male in some kind of executive role. Just take this first sentence. The 1983 Senator range has been designed and built for the fast-moving executive, and indeed, everyone else who appreciates power, luxury and performance combined with advanced style. As you would expect, the specification is lavish. Fuel-injected engines, disc brakes all round, power steering, tiltable steering wheel, tinted glass, electrically operated and heated door mirrors, twin front and rear fog lamps, headlamp wash wipe, electric boot release, radio cassette player, steel sunroof and central door locking are among the comprehensive equipment of all three models in the range. Naturally, the interiors of all Senators reflect the prestigious exterior appearance, with every consideration given to driver and passenger comfort. The Senator 2.5e will appeal to motorists who place an emphasis on luxury at an affordable price. Then the choice widens to the 130mph Senator 3.0e, and the top model in the range, the 3.0e Senator CD, which includes even air conditioning as standard, together with an electric sunroof, heated front seats, and electric windows. And both the 3.0e Senator and Senator CD have automatic transmissions as standard. But above even the Senator was the Manta's big brother, the Opel Monza. This car, for all intents and purposes, was a Senator Coupe, because why not? Before Vauxhall and Opel rationalised, the Monza was also available as a Vauxhall Royale Coupe, name-checking its saloon car counterpart. But as with the Manta, the Opel badge version is the one British people actually remember. It's not a sports car by any stretch of the imagination. Instead, it's a big luxury coupe, something more like a Mercedes C123 or BMW 6 Series. Thanks to its size, it's more about wafting about in six-cylinder velour upholstered comfort rather than going for performance. Having said that, GM clearly tried to play up its sportiness. The performance of a thoroughbred sports car and the luxury of a limousine give the 1983 Monza a unique character. Add to this advanced aerodynamic styling, the versatility of a hatchback and comfort and space more usually found in family cars, and the Monza's concept is very special indeed. Certainly, the Monza's performance is as fast as its shape. In a brief 8.2 seconds with the fuel-injected six-cylinder engine, the Monza scorches to 60 miles per hour, and with an exhilarating 180 horsepower on tap, the maximum is in the order of 130 miles per hour where speed limits allow. I'm not really sure how I feel about the Monza. From the 1982 vintage facelifted front, it has sporting intent. It's not aggressive, but suggestive of performance and a sporting character. But from the sides and rear, it shows its age a little bit more, hailing from 78. It's a weird blend of conservative luxury and 80s sportiness, but I love the spec of the one shown here. 
Silver paintwork may not stand out too much, but it goes perfectly with the blue velour. Please manufacturers, bring back colourful interiors. With the Monza, we round out the range, and with this we can see how opals were differentiated from voxels. Only the Manta, Senator and Monza are opals, and those three are, theoretically, the most desirable ones. Once the Senator went back to being a Vauxhall, only the Manta and Monza, the two coupés, were opals, and that makes a lot of marketing sense, that by 1990, the opal badge will have left the British market for good. So there is a look at General Motors' British range in 1983. A really interesting era to examine as it was just at the start of Vauxhall's big climb up to challenge Ford, overtaking British Leyland for good and becoming a company that British people really wanted to buy cars from. Vauxhalls of the 1980s were desirable, much more so than those of the early 70s, and showcasing how well that company introduced front drive to its family car range. But for now, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to Twincam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.